So like, yeah. Um, but he was a sweet soul. He loved to sing. Um, I remember um doing shows. Me and my brother Nathaniel had like shows for them. So we would go in our rooms and we would practice these shows too. We would rehearse these fake shows that nobody was recording. Nobody except my brother and sister Megan, Jonathan and Megan would show up to these shows. Sometimes when family would come over for like Christmas and Thanksgiving, me and Nathaniel would, you know, practice a Christmas show or a Thanksgiving show for the family. But that was rare. Like sometimes we would do it, not all the time. Um, so we know Jonathan loved to sing. So we would do these shows and stuff and we called them shows, but like they were more like a worship experience or whatever song we wanted to do that day. Like if it wasn't a worship song, it was like a Jonas Brothers song or a Barney song because we were kids too. Um, at the time too, Toby Mac, Skillet. And we would just memorize these songs, memorize some dance moves at the point where this word came, we would do like a jump or something. Like we would choreograph each other. And um, then we would do that for like 30, 40 minutes to however long we're like, we got this. And then we would play the entire CD. I remember this one Barney CD that we had. We, we, bro, we scratched the crap out of that, how much we used it. Like we would, like that was my favorite CD. I don't care who judges me on me saying that. Barney was lit back in the day. If you don't, Barney, Barney the homie, okay? I love you. You love me. We a big happy family, ain't we? Huh? Okay. So, um, yeah. Um, the CD, we would just, you know, rehearse and then memorize. And then we would let, Nathan I mean, Jonathan and Megan in. And they would sit on our beds. And, you know, we would open, we would go to the bathroom. Because me and Nathan shared the uh, master bedroom um, together on that side of the house. My parents shared the other bedroom on the other side of the house, the other master. Um, so we had a bathroom in our room and we would close the bathroom door and we would start the intro like of the song, we would play it and then run back to the bathroom. And then once it hit a certain point, we would bust out the bathroom and start our show, you know? And then that, we did that often. Like me and Nathaniel did shows often. Like we would practice, even if it wasn't a show, like we would just be in our room jamming together, you know, listening to music together. And that's like God, like, you know, me and him just learning my craft at an early age. Like I would take shoe boxes and set them up as a drum set. I would take a shoe box and put a circle hole in it and then like get a stick and then like get some string like shoelaces and then tape them and make a fake guitar. Like I was a very creative person in the sense of like, if I didn't have it, I would make it. Okay. Nerf guns. I didn't have a holster, get a tissue box, cover the hole up, cut a hole on one of the sides, tape a belt to it, put whatever you want, a bandana around it to give it like some color and whatever tape that on or tie it on and then put tape the uh, belt on and you got yourself a holster put your gun in there boom and you make it to the size that you need you get a shoe box that's big enough if it's a longer shotgun type of like nerf gun you're gonna want like a vans box and you tape the vans box up so it doesn't open you cut a hole and so your gun can fit in and boom you got yourself a holster there okay you got to come up with what you got and so I would create these often. You can ask my whole family. I would just create these things. Like, Dondre, what do you have today? Oh, this is my guitar made out of shoestring, a Payless box, and some gum. Like, this is <laughs> so, um, yeah. So I would make that stuff. And, you know, then it got to a point where, like, you know, I was actually trying to learn instruments. So I got a little guitar bought it myself with Christmas money and stuff. Um, started learning a little guitar, gave up because I couldn't get the C chord. Like I wanted to learn the actual C chord, not the little cheat code C chord. I wanted to be actual professional and know like how a C actually, you know, felt to play. But I couldn't get my fingers to do it. 
And now, you know, it's like my, one of my favorite chords, F and C, because they like line up with each other. So, um, yeah. Um, anyways, yeah, so I started learning a little guitar and stuff. So I would actually play the guitar with these shows and like do like actual like guitar playing. It wasn't good. Like I didn't have any rhythm at that point, but I was getting there. Like this is me in the dark, like getting, you know, molded into what I would become today on like an actual worship set with a worship team and a worship leader and all these people that I trust and they trust me to learn these songs now, you know, and to lead people into the throne room of God through worship, you know? So literally I remember um, just at an early age doing that. And then eventually, um, here, hold on. Let me stop this because it's about to end. Okay, so like I said, eventually, um, these people came because we lived in the duplex for a while and it was getting moldy and bad. Like it was getting leaks were coming through the roof, like, and we couldn't keep up with it. Like it was just too much and it was unsafe. So here in Palm Beach Gardens, there's a private school on Burns Road called the Wise School. Um, now, at the Wise School, there was a principal at the time, around in 2007 or so. Oh, and I didn't even explain. In 2007, whenever you get adopted, like, as a child, um, you get a Make-A-Wish. And each kid, before I got adopted, got a Make-A-Wish. One went to Syracuse, New York. Another one went to Disney. Another one had Give Kids the World, which is all Orlando parks included for a week for free. The only thing you have to pay for is food. That's it. Transportation is taken care of. Bed is taken care of for everybody in your family. So um, they did Give Kids the World twice before me, and I got to do one with them for Thomas's. And then we had to cut SeaWorld and Islands of Adventure short because Thomas got sick, but we'll get there. Um, but yeah, so my make a wish in 2007, I want to say this before I get to the other part, cause, um, this happens before my make a wish in 2007 was a Disney cruise. And now everybody else had to get theirs picked for them. So, you know, my parents, um, picked for the other kids. I think only one other person, Nathaniel, I think was the only other person that got to pick his. Cause I remember going on his, um, so he got to pick his. So me and him got to pick ours. I didn't go on the other people's except me, Nathaniel, and Thomas's because they hadn't done Thomas yet. Um, so I got to go on three Make-A-Wishes, mine, then Nathaniel's, then Thomas's. Um, and then, so, uh, yeah, I went on a Disney cruise. It was an amazing time. You know, if you know the Disney cruise, it was an amazing time. You know, I don't need to explain that. I can do that in another story time if y'all want. I have tons of story times throughout this that I can, like, go off on. But, like, it's just going to be too long. I'm going to tell you, like, the main parts. Um, So went on the Disney cruise. And then a couple, you know, weeks after that. Well, not weeks. Like, maybe a year or two after that. Um. We went on Nathaniel's to Syracuse, New York, um, on a farm. That was fun. Uh, it was very cold, though. It was in the middle of October, I think. Very cold. Um, and, uh, yeah. So then, after that, I remember it was around 2000, middle 2007, 8-ish maybe i want to say because we went on our last trip in 2000 oh no okay so we didn't go on nathaniel's until 2010 2011. no we went yeah we went on nathaniel's in 2008 and we went on Thomas's in 2010? Yeah, 2010. 
So 2008 for Nathaniel, 2010 for Thomas. And then I remember in between 2008 and 2010, the Y school where I was just talking about, heard about our uh, thing to try to get into, uh, if you don't know this show, home, um, Extreme Home Makeovers, we had applied to them because we desperately needed a house and they do special needs houses and people who are desperately in need like we were in big families like that. But they were already booked and they were swamped with like bookings already. So they declined us. Um, so the white school over here on Burns Road heard about that and they wanted to do something. So they started fundraising at the school. So they would tell the kids if they raise a certain amount of money doing these fundraisers around the school for a whole year and a half or so the principal would buzz her hair into a mohawk and get a candy cane striped for that Christmas. And these kids actually hit the goal. Her husband, mind you, owned his own construction company. So that's why she was like, we'll do it for you. I'll get my husband's company to do it for you. You know, so she literally for like a year and a half, we were talking about plans and rooms. We got to pick all of our rooms. Um, and there were going to be eight bedrooms, four bathrooms. Um, and it was beautiful when it came out, let me tell you. Um, so they planned it all and I got to, you know, plan my room and it was a Scooby-Doo theme room. I didn't know how it was going to look. I just said, I want Scooby-Doo on the walls. My other sister got kitty cats and butterflies. That was Megan. Uh, Adrian got like, a teenage girl's room, Jonas Brother poster, Hannah Montana poster. It was all pink with hearts and everything. Uh, what else? A Miley poster, but it was Hannah Montana at the time. What else? Yeah, she had a lot of different posters from different, like, teenage singing groups at the time from Nickelodeon and various places. But, um, yeah. Then, I want to say Nathaniel had a baseball theme room, the Cardinals room, and they had a big mural of the, a Cardinal player on a pitch and like throwing a ball. Um, and then he also had a signed baseball bat, which my dad and mom took away because he had some anger problems, okay? So as soon as we saw the room and they revealed it to us on the reveal day, they took it down like that night. Like they were like, yeah, you're not, having this in your room so you can just beat people with a baseball bat or destroy stuff we're taking this out so it was a nice gesture and we kept the baseball bat but he didn't have it he could hold it for a couple minutes whenever he wanted like he would ask dad hey can i see the baseball bat yeah here but it was in a controlled environment you know but um yeah it was a good time um who else? Jonathan had a Mickey Mouse and Goofy room. So it was Mickey Mouse and Goofy and Pluto sitting on a pond fishing. Um, painted on the walls. This is painted on all of our walls. My room was a Scooby-Doo room. So each Scooby-Doo character was on each wall. Two um, Shaggy and Scooby were on one wall and then the others were on the other four walls. And then a mystery machine on a wall too. And then the behind my door was a tree a bear tree like that you see in like scary movies with no leaves and bats and the moon like flying behind it um and then these huge like question marks all over the walls on each wall there was like one big question mark like on each wall in green and i remember it was yellow and green um people might say it's ugly but it matched the theme of scooby-doo at the time so I liked it. A Scooby-Doo room is crazy. And if I can find a picture, I'll try to put it on here. Uh, after we lived there for a while, you know, we got no, you know, got used to living there and everybody, they had a whole uh, central vac system. And if you've never had a central vac system, I feel like every house should have one. But it's for the bad and bougie, I feel like too. Like it could be either or, but it should be implemented. <laughs> Excuse me, into every house. 
so yeah as we got used to the house um but oh yeah well what i was saying before i got interrupted um was the central vac system basically is there's holes around the house in every section that lead this pipe a suction pipe basically and then in the laundry room there was this huge canister that you put a trash bag in and you basically have this hose this vacuum hose that you go in to wherever the plugs were in the house they were in the wall and you would lift up the little flap and plug the little vacuum into the uh the wall and then it would automatically start up the vacuum and you would hear it throughout the whole house like the suction thing going and um so that's how you would vacuum the house um because it was a big house it was an open floor a bedroom like it was a beautiful house and if i have some pictures i'll show you you know as i'm talking here but um so they had the vacuum system and i remember also before like when they were building the house um we actually got to demolish our old house and right on the walls before so during the time when they announced that we were going to get a new house, they said, you guys can write on the walls because we're going to tear them down anyways. We're just keeping the frame, but we're, we're going to gut the whole entire inside and like make it new, you know, knock down some walls and, you know, put new ones where we need to um, and support where we need to. But basically it's going to be a clear open floor plan. Okay. Uh, with different rooms. So you can see the entire house from the front door. Um, yeah, it was pretty big, but it was also like, you know, open. So during that time we got to demolish, we, during the demolition day, we got to go there and like knock down all the walls. Like they gave us kids, like our eight year olds, 10 year old kids sledgehammers and we were just going to work to these walls and so um then after that we're now back to where they finished the house we got the tour and we're living there but yeah the central air vacuum thing central vacuum thing was cool we had the washer dryer in the backyard oh my goodness they asked us if we wanted to pull and my mom said no because she didn't want to take care of it and i get that but I, re bro, bro, we made sure mom knew that we wanted that pool and she should have picked the pool. <laughs> we had the basketball court though. So like I got pretty good at shooting hoops and like getting my moves and handles right. I mean, I'm still trash, but like, you know, I played a lot of basketball because that's what we had. They had an in-ground basketball hoop on brick pavement. They should have made it flat. I don't know why they did brick, but like, whatever for my cripple behind it was horrible but like for everybody else it was okay but i got there you know i still hooped i still hooped the backyard was beautiful palm trees everywhere little bushes everywhere with flowers they made the backyard beautiful it had a grill and two you know patio tables glass patio tables um with umbrellas um it was beautiful you know it was an amazing house, and I wish we could have kept it until, you know, the day I moved out because I was married. <laughs> but life happens. And I've told myself, one day, I'm going to go back and buy that house, and it's going to be my house, and it's going to be our house again. You know, our house again, the Gornflow house. But we'll see, you know, we'll see. Anyways, um, so fast forward a couple months, my brother Thomas, after we went on the Make-A-Wish for him to give kids the world, um, he got sick in the middle of that vacation and we had to rush him to the hospital. And then we were like, if he makes it through the night, if my parents were like, if, we, if he is okay for the rest of the week, because we still had Thursday and Friday to go to SeaWorld and Islands of Adventure those two days. And they said, if he's good, we'll, we'll stay and we'll finish the days that we have. If he's not, we got to leave, guys, and take him to our home hospital here, St. Mary's. 
um, so he can get the care and the doctors know him there. So like, you know, the care that he needs. And we're like, okay. So we were like praying like, Lord, please, we want, you know, please. He didn't, he didn't, no. He, he got even worse and it was like a scary, we were all scared. Like we thought we were going to lose him on the way to the hospital. We were in Orlando and we had to get to Palm Beach Gardens before like he died. You know, that's how bad it was. And we would have ambulanced him. He had insurance, but it was like too much. Like we wanted to be there just in case like he was going, you know, we wanted to be there at his last moments. And we were like, when he was actually going, we were all by his side, like, you know, holding his hand and, you know, singing his favorite songs. We had the Gaithers in the background. Um, but he got bad and then, but he made it like he went to the hospital. He was there for like a couple weeks, but he made it. And I remember like when he came home, he went straight on to hospice care because they didn't, they were like, he made it, but like, we don't know how long he's going to make it. Like it could be tomorrow. It could be in three months, you know, we don't know. But, um, so he was on hospice watch. And, you know, I remember like one day, like when he was like coughing and coughing and they had to go back to the hospital. When he got home, I remember breaking down and crying like, God, don't take my brother. Don't take my brother. Don't take my brother. You know, and I was crying. I don't know if my mom remembers this, but like I was crying. Like I, I was like, God. If you're real, if you take my brother, I don't want you no more. I don't take him. So I was like, really like, very like serious. Like I did not want to lose him. And like, he survived a couple months after that. And then in 2011, uh, I want to say maybe four or five months before his birthday. So his birthday is in December. So maybe June, summerish, maybe beginning of summer before summer, he got really sick, and we all knew that was the night he was going. You know, that's how bad it was. He was not breathing well. He was barely responding to anything. And mind you, for his old time to eat was through a tube. He never had food through his mouth ever in his life ever. It was always through a button that connected to a feeding bag on an IV pole formula poured into that bag that would drip into his stomach slowly every day, all day, every day, just slowly dripping into him. We would give him two cans a day, one in the morning and one at night, and sometimes a half in between for lunch or whatever, just in case he got hungry, you know, in the middle. But like, you know, he couldn't eat. He couldn't see. He could only hear. He couldn't move. He was barely breathing. Every every breath was like. <sighs> that was his breathing every single day, all day. Like that was Thomas. And like each of us kids would take turns throughout his life, you know, as we grew up together, I'm holding him, like he would lean on us and we would just, you know, have him, you know, leaning on us and we would talk to him and, you know, let him know that your brother here loves you, your sister here loves you, you know, we're thankful for you no matter what condition you're in, you know, you're a joy to us. And um, yeah, so that night we all slept in the living room and my dad, who my dad loved this little boy with all his heart, all his, that was him and Thomas were like the son and father duo of the century. Like he made Thomas giggle and laugh with his stupid little voices. <laughs> That's what my dad would do all the time. And my, my brother would like giggle all the time. So it's like, yeah. It was a good sweet time, but my dad was holding him in his arms um, and we were all sleeping in the living room. Me, my siblings and my mom just waiting until, you know, 
my dad didn't go to sleep. I think he rested his eyes a little bit, but like he wanted to know when he was gone. So you know, I remember waking up at like, what, like one thirty, two o'clock and the nurse waking us all up and dad waking us all up and he was crying and, and he looked at us and he's like, your brother's gone. And we all cried and hugged him, his little body. And um, it took a couple hours, but my dad held his little body, lifeless little body for like an hour until the coroner people, the funeral home people came to come and get him. We had already prepared, you know, the people to come in the morning just in case. But, um, yeah, uh, they had to come a little sooner. So they came at like 3 o'clock-ish, 3.30 in the morning to get the body and uh we all said goodbye and watched them drive his body away for the last time we would see him like full because they cremated him so there wasn't an open casket or nothing um but we had his funeral it was a beautiful service um one of my friends jordan's dad actually uh sung at his funeral it was a very beautiful service and i won't forget that day ever and I even have a necklace that has like every person in my family that has died that I could like at that moment that when I got it, cause two other people have died since, but they were on that necklace and 2011 was the reason I got that necklace was because of him. And I was like, and Jonathan and dad. Now we'll get there. But, um, yeah, we uh we celebrated his life in that moment, and then um, fast forward a little bit, we uh we couldn't afford the house like at this point. Like we had like other people living with us too, so like we had a whole nother family living with us. Uh, Jordan and Kayla, Demetrius, Jessica. Um, it was my sister's um, biological mom's side of the family. Um, she uh, still to this day has contact with her biological mom and siblings, half siblings, I should say. Um, she has a whole nother story. I, I hope someday she tells her story too, because it's very interesting as well, Adrian. Um, but uh yeah, so they lived with us for a while. Other people were, like, we were basically an Airbnb where you live with the family, though. Like, we were the family that opened their house to anybody. You need a house to live in, we're that house. You need a food to eat that night, we're that house. Come in. Like, the door is always open, we told everybody. Like, the door is always open. Like, we have nothing to hide. We have nothing to, you know, we're trying to live for God, represent God. Now, are we perfect? No, we have our flaws, but like, we will show love first. That's the one thing I was told, show love first. Um, And we would do devotions every night. Like ever since I was there, like I forgot to mention that, like every night we would have quiet time where dad would open the Bible or a little devotional book with the Bible and read scripture and a story that related to the scripture. And um, that's that was ingrained in us at a very young age. So still to this day, I have devotional every single either night or morning because it's like, I need that. That's like a part of my childhood. And um, so, yeah, we would um, be able to uh, have each night a devotional night. And then each night, one of us would also have a time with mom for an hour in her arms. And she would hold us for an hour each night around like seven, eight o'clock after everybody else went to bed. One person that night on their night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we each had a night. Mom was Saturday. Um, we would get to sit on mom's lap in the rocking chair and just lay with her and talk to her and watch either a show or a movie that we picked and, you know, talk about the day or whatever we wanted to talk about, you know? And like, but she would use it. Like sometimes she would be like, if you're, if you're bad on your night, there's no rock, rock night. 
Okay, you're going straight to bed. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, that was fun. And those memories were great. And so, <clears throat> yeah, we had people in and out all the time. And it just came to a point where like, we couldn't afford the, the house anymore. And during that time, like, uh, I think it was like a year before we gave up the house, maybe a year and a half before, we had bed bugs. So now anytime I hear, don't let the bed bugs bite, I'm like, please be quiet. Please be quiet. Please be quiet. And um, yeah, now, uh, I don't do bed bugs anymore. Get those things away from me. We had an infestation. They were on the sheets. They were in the dryer. They were... They were in the ceiling. They were in the walls. They were on your bed. They were in the t- bathroom. They were in the sink. They, were, bro, they were everywhere. And not only did we have bed bugs, we had termites at one point with the bed bugs. I was like, bro, it's a infestation party in here, bro. It was so bad. We had to tent the house. And when it gets that bad, we lived with bed bugs for a year and a half, guys. Biting me every night. I would try to sleep in the living room, still biting me. Sleep in my bedroom, still biting me. Sleep in the kitchen, still still biting me. They were everywhere, everywhere, except the refrigerator and pantry. They didn't like food like that. They like blood. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, it was just a horrible time during that time. And then, you know, we had people in and out, but. It was fine having the people in and out. It just, you know, means more electric and water and all that. So it just came to a point where, like, we couldn't afford it. And once they moved out and had their own thing, we just couldn't afford it still, uh, even with the six, seven of us left. Um, Yeah. Uh, Then once my mom sold it, that was right after... um, Right after high school, no, right before high school, my mom sold that house. Or maybe just freshman year, like middle freshman year, we moved in 2015. 2015, we got that apartment at Sand Tree Drive. And I remember for a year, we were all just living there, me, Brian, Jonathan, Nathaniel, Megan, all of us in this three bedroom apartment now from an eight, four to a three, two. It was a big change and like, it was okay. Like I made the most out of every place. I didn't like it. Like I wanted to go back to my Scooby-Doo room and all that, but nope. So me, Brian and Nathaniel shared a room. Nathan, I mean, Aiden and Megan shared a room. Dad got his own room that mom could sleep in if she wanted, but she slept down the stairs with Jonathan on the couch and Jonathan got the recliner. And that's how we slept for a year in that order. And we had the laundry room and the bathroom downstairs underneath the staircase. And we had a little kitchen, a little, little, little dining area, not that big, um, a little patio in the back, but that's about it. It was really not that big for like, all the people <laughs> that we had in there. And for like good, like three, four months, we didn't have Wi Fi or cable or nothing. We were just unpacking and trying to settle in, you know, from what we already knew, you know? Um, so, yeah, um, we all lived there for a while. And then I went to camp that year. And, um, when I went to camp, it was all fine and dandy and whatever. Like, I didn't think nothing of it. But then when I came home, my life would change. Uh, my mom and dad had separated while I was gone at camp. And when I came home, my mom had dropped me off at the church to go to camp. When I got home, my dad was waiting. And, well, he wasn't even waiting. He, I had to wake him up you know, to come and get me. 
And I was, I thought that was a little weird. I was like, why is dad coming to get me? I thought mom, yeah, cause mom said, I'll be here this weekend to pick you up. You know, when you come back, I'm like, all right, bet. But he came to pick me up and he asked me like, I'm, I'm tired. I've been out of North Carolina for a whole week in the mountains and just had a 14 hour, 15 hour bus ride with a bunch of sleep deprived junk food filled kids that just are hopped up on the Lord right now. So we've been singing and screaming and shouting and playing and whatever. And I'm tired. And he's like, do you want to grab a bite to eat? And my dad usually never does this. Like he's a nice guy, but like when it comes to like buying stuff, nah, not like that. Not like my mom. My mom is the buyer. She'll, she'll give you a soda or a chip, whatever, you know, this guy, you ask him for like, hey, can we go to McDonald's? He'll be like, nah, let's make a sandwich at home, you know? So, <laughs> um, yeah, so he said, you want to go to McDonald's? And I already found that weird, but I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll get some cookies. But I already just ate like McDonald's three hours ago on the road. But I guess I'll get another French fry and cookies and a drink or something. So he goes there and then that's when he sits me down in the booth and I'm eating. And he's like, you good? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, I have to tell you something. And I'm like, what? And he shows me a note. And it's basically, um, he just shows me a little part of it. And it says, I have to leave some space or something like that. And it's from mom. And he's like, yeah. So basically what this is saying, your mom left us. I'm like, what? What do you mean left us? I'm, I'm like 16, 17 like at this point, so I understand what's going on. Like, what do you mean you, she left us? And she was like, well, she's not going to be coming anymore. She's gone. I'm like, what do you mean? Is she going to come back? Like, she's like, I don't know. I'm like, what do you, what? And so I was very confused that night and kind of like in awe, shock. And at this point, I was already smoking weed doing all that stuff like so this made me want to just smoke more like i was like forget this forget this so i just you know hit up my friend and we just burned and burned and burned and burned i remember just burned and burned and burned and then i remember going to church like the next weekend and like telling jeremy and like some other people and like breaking down it was like I was going through it. Like that was the moment my whole thing changed. Like, like that's when I started like smoking heavy and like drinking with people and going down a very different path than I am today. I could tell you that. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, it was just like bad and dark. And I remember Jeremy being there and shout out Jeremy Vinsel for being a shoulder I could lean on and Jared um, too. Uh, in that moment, they stepped up and were there for me. So always shout out to those two. Um, <laughs> we walk out the back and Jeremy's shirt is all drenched in my tears. Like <laughs> this man is a real one. You know, we're about to start service and he's already like covered in tears. Like, <laughs> Uh, from somebody else, not even him. Like, yeah, he's a real one. Um, but anyways, uh, so that happens. And so that's another milestone to get through and like mental block to like, kind of like, you know, overcome. And like, I remember like somebody telling me like, yeah, you just need to burn, bro. I mean, that was the worst advice you give to somebody grieving. But that's, you know what the enemy will do when you're grieving? He'll just open a door to something that you're like, ah, what the heck? And I, I said to myself, years, every year, like to people too, like that would do it. I don't do that. I will never do that. Don't ever say never. Okay? Don't ever say never. Because God will test you and the devil will test you even more. So, um, yeah. Uh, so there's that. And then I want to say <clears throat> a month or two into that, my mom calls, like I hadn't heard for, from her in like 
two months. And like, we're all living there, me, Brian, Adrian, and dad, and Nathaniel. Well, no, Nathaniel's in a group home at this point. Um, and so are my other siblings. They're in group homes at this point. Um, group homes are just places where people can live that have disabilities or like, they just don't have housing and they have Medicaid and Medicare and all that, that will cover it. Um, so yeah, um, they were there and we were at the apartment with dad. Now dad stopped feeding us. Like, I want to say a couple months in, he's like, get a job and pay rent, get your own food. Basically I'll pay for a little bit of groceries, like milk butter that's it you know basically and uh he also found himself a little girlfriend and now mind you my parents were just separated they weren't divorced they were just separated so that's a whole nother story like there well like so he found his own little girlfriend my mom knew about it and was like all the time bringing it up and it was just a whole back and forth. He did, they did, whatever, that. And, you know, divorce is not pretty. Or separation or divorce, just either one is not pretty, like, on either side. like. And it's like, we were stuck with dad. And mom was trying to figure out her own thing. She had always did everything for the kids and for dad. Like, everything was about kids and dad. And still to this day, it's about kids, like us. And we always came before him. Like, she did not care. She was, she was hanging on for us, you know, until she couldn't, until we were old enough to be like, yeah, hey, I'm leaving. Like, y'all got to figure this out. You know, I, I've done enough. And I, I respect it. You know, she had to do what she had to do. And so, yeah, um, fast forward after that, we get to a part where um, then – Brian moves out or is kicked out. And then um, Adrian, me, and some other friends of ours um, start hanging out at the house. It becomes a trap house. And my dad knows it. He can't do nothing about it. We're like, we took over the house, basically. And that was our rebellion to him for not feeding us and like not being the best support in the time that we were going through. And I know we were old enough to understand and should have been mature enough to understand like, hey, this is not the way to act. If you're not okay with it, you should talk about it. But like, I was only 18. My sister was only like 20. We were in our rebellious teens and 20s, like early 20s. Like, I wasn't going to school, me and Jordan, because Jordan lived with us again at that point, and Demetrius too. Um, had lived at, with us at one point. And me and Jordan were not waking up for school. We were just saying, no, we're not going. And if we did go, we would be late, like two hours late sometimes, three hours late. We wouldn't care. Walk in, grab our detention. I would never go to detention. Jordan would sometimes go just to talk to friends that were there. Um, uh it was just a bad time in my life where, like, I was letting people, you know, trap there and sell drugs in my room, have guns and all this other stuff. And it was just a crazy time. But um, then after that, I moved from there. And I had started a little band called Extroverse um, 2. And other people were in and out of the house at that time. My dad was still doing his own thing, kind of. We would talk occasionally, but we were at, like, a distant, like, we were at a distant thing at this point. And, like, you know, I had drums, too. Um, so in the middle of all of that, before um, the sand tree, I was called to be um, – a drummer for the Spanish ministry at CITG and Pastor de Carla, who is the Filizola, the ones that run the church now that I go to and the one that ran the Espanol service at Church and Gardens. Uh, her son, Nathan Filizola, who is now the pastor of Encounter Church of Jupiter, Florida, we're saving you a seat. Um, 
but yeah, uh, she called me to come and play drums because he was a drummer and she heard I played for the youth and, you know, was playing drums for the youth and they needed a drummer. So I wasn't very good. I had only been playing for three months, but I was for the youth. So she was like, I trusted enough to, you know, give you a shot. And the rest is history. I've been playing for 12, 13 years now, almost. And known them for about 15 years now. So that whole family. And we were just talking about it this past weekend on my birthday, how long I've been with them. 15 years. It's crazy. So, yeah, um, they uh, called me. So I was drumming at this point, too. Um, and playing piano for English service at Church in the Gardens. And then also, what else? Oh, yeah. Um, after that, after the Trap House era, I moved out and, you know, said goodbye to all my trap friends and Matt and everybody. And then I moved to Port St. Lucie to a group home with my brother. We lived there for a little bit, had fun. You know, we snuck out sometimes. Shh, don't tell nobody. Even though I just told everybody. It's all right, though. Um, yeah, it was a fun time living with him and, you know, riding our bikes and doing all the shows in our room, you know, just playing PlayStation. I remember Spider-Man, The Amazing Spider-Man came out or Marvel Spider-Man came out around that time, the same month I had moved in. So we were playing PlayStation together. I bought myself a PlayStation. I had gotten $10,000 that I blew in like a year. <laughs> uh, and yeah, it was a crazy time during that time. And then I remember I moved uh, Southern Boulevard to another group home um, after that. But this was during the pandemic. So in 2018, I moved to Port St. Lucie. And then in 2020, like around the time the pandemic was bubbling up, we were at this um, one house. But we had to wait at another house because the pandemic was so bad. So I remember for like a month or two, we couldn't move because like, they didn't want people traveling or going places and the group home had like policies. So we weren't allowed to move and we were at this random house, this random group home in the middle of Port St. Lucie for like two months, three months, you know, living out of our backpacks. <laughs> um, and then um, eventually we were able to move into our, our actual group home, shared a room there for a while, I became a PC gamer. Uh, also regained my faith in the Lord there. And actually try to do better nowadays than I was back then. But um, yeah, it was a good time over there. And then eventually my mom wanted to see if we could all live together again. So we all got an apartment together on the same street that we used to all grow up on East Island Pines Boulevard. Um, and it was just a blocks down from the renovated house that we had back in 2009. So for a whole year, two years, we would always drive past that house and just look at it and be like, remember those memories in there? Because we lived right down and then we had a dog. So whenever we walked the dog, we would walk past. And sometimes we would just stand there and my mom would talk to the people who run the house. It's like a halfway house for like addicts and all that. So she would talk to her. I'm glad it's being put to good use, you know, and not just whatever, you know. Um, so that's good. Um, and then, yeah. We lived there for like two years. Nathaniel had moved out at this point back to a group home. Um, Brian was there with me and mom was there. And then me and Brian wanted to get out to our own places. And so did a mom. She didn't want to live there anymore either. So we all split. And I went to go live with one of my friends, the Jimenez's. 
family. And uh, then I lived there for a whole year. And that was amazing, you know. Ups and downs, but it was an amazing time. I got to live with Josh, my homie Chickenhead Josh. Shout out Chickenhead Josh. And then um, so we gamed and, you know, I played my music, my guitar, got better at my craft. And then I went through the most difficult time of my life, heartbreak. <laughs> and this moment of life was like crazy because like it wasn't rejection. It was more like friendship that was so long that I wasn't expecting to lose in the way I did. And that's what broke me. It wasn't the thing that I did or any shame or guilt from that. It was more of the way it happened that I was more upset about and like discouraged about. I just wish things played out differently in that season. And like, it's actually helped me become more aware of my spiritual reality um, and relying ability on God. Because like, when I tell you I had never gone through more pain and I'm still going through it today as I'm making this video like every day and every weekend and every couple days, it's a battle still, you know, but uh, I'm working through it and some days are better than others, but like I'm always going to be true to myself. I can't fake the feeling, you know. Uh, and, you know, being guided by God through this journey of like self-healing, mental healing, mental cleansing, uh, finding myself and like what I'm truly passionate about, not just what others are passionate about and trying to get passionate with them because the days they're passionate, I might not be passionate about it, but I'll always be passionate about what I'm passionate about, you know? so. It was more about finding what I really long for in life, which is to represent God everywhere I go, to be honest. Like, there's not a person outside of church and even in church that knows that. I always bring up Jesus in some sort of way. Like, I'll make a joke or, like, it'll be brought up. His name will be brought up or the topic will be brought up in some way. And, like, some people get annoyed. Okay, I, I'm sorry. This is what I like to talk about, you know. Um, even throughout this whole thing, I keep bringing it back to God because it's like, that's the number one thing on my mind all day, every day. And, uh, that's what should be all on our minds every day, all day. Now, am I perfect? And, and like, I act on all those thoughts? No. Like, sometimes I don't always tell the truth. Sometimes I do look at a girl lustfully. Like, I've had trauma in that area, you know? I've dealt with porn. I've dealt with all that stuff. Like, and like, you got to just keep yourself grounded. Like if you don't, then it's like, you're just going to sail off. Like I did during that depression, just whatever time that was, I had to go through and be molded by God, let go of what I wanted and get what God wanted, you know? And not to say that like, it isn't what God wants, but maybe it's just not the time. Or maybe there's something better. You never know. So you just got to pray and be still. And if it's a no, it's a no. If it's a maybe, it's a maybe. If it's a wait, it's a wait. And if it's a no, it's a no. Well, I don't believe in maybes. God knows. So if it's a no, it's a no. If it's a yes, it's a yes. If it's a wait, it's a wait. So those are the three answers you'll get from God. If it's not those three, it's not from God. Because God is not indecisive. It's not a, um, we'll see. He knows. Like, he knows when and where and how and why. So why even, you know, worry? If he dresses the lilies with beauty and splendor, how much more does he love you? Like, he, he's he got your back. So, um, yeah, to say all that, <clears throat> moved in with them. They took me in and then, Eventually, I made the stupid decision to move to Lake Worth. This was a hasty decision. I will admit that. I can admit when I'm wrong. Like, hey, and now I'm paying for it, literally and physically because of transportation. But um, 
God's going to sort it out in the timing that it's supposed to be sorted out. And I'm just here waiting this time for the right moment. And there's never going to be a perfect moment, but the right moment will be the perfect moment when it's God's time. So now that you guys are all caught up, um, thank you for listening. I know that was a super, super, super long uh, testimony, but um, I just wanted to tell y'all that Jesus works things out in different ways. You may not see it today, but eventually you'll see his hand move throughout your life. Look at me and my brother, the story about that. Look at the house when Extreme Makeover wasn't able to do it. Look at how many times I've been like helped out in a living situation. If my story doesn't show you God's love, you just aren't willing to give up what you love. So I pray that this Lord, this testimony, as nervous as I was trying to make this and procrastinated it off for days, I pray that it helps somebody see that no matter where or what you go through, there is always light at the end of the tunnel and that you are always right beside them, even in the small moments, even in the sad moments, even in the good moments. You are always there, and you are always good. And I pray that somebody feels that today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all for watching. Uh, let me know if you all want to hear other stories. I'll try to figure out some stories I can tell that I didn't tell in this. Because I kind of try to stick to the main timeline so you can see, like, the life come together that I've lived and what's influenced me and what's I've had to grow through and go through. And, yeah, so if you're ever in Jupiter, Encounter Church, Jupiter, Florida, 10 a.m. English, 12 a.m. Espanol for my Spanish-speaking familia uh and yeah subscribe or like or follow on whatever this is posted on and if you don't that's all right if you made it this far you're a real one and i will see you soon